Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good to meet you. And I want to say that I'm grateful for the opportunity to preach here this morning. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I count it a privilege. Uh, it's been a blessing to spend time with Brother Adam Fannin and also the men from yesterday. So we give God glory for that. I want you to know that. And I want you to know I'm glad to be here. Let me also say uh, greetings from Faithful Word Baptist Church. And I can say personally and with confidence, our heart beats with yours. It really does in every sense of the word. I can tell you all love the Bible. You want to know it. You want to live it. You're here because you want to be. It's not always easy. There's a lot of sacrifice made to start a church and get it moving and get it going. But you're doing it. Yeah. So, um, we encourage you. We pray for you. Hope that you'll pray for us. So, greetings from Faithful Word Baptist Church. You're there in Nehemiah, right? Yes. I want to read a couple more verses one more time. In the first part of the chapter, the Bible says this. Chapter 6 is where we were. Now, it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein. Though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. You get the picture, right? Yeah. Nehemiah, the governor, the appointed man to lead this task, is doing what God's called him to do. And these two wicked men are doing what they do best in trying to distract, discourage, and stop a righteous man from doing what he needs to do to obey the Lord. Right. And I love Nehemiah's answer. And I hope it will ring out in your heart today and maybe throughout this week as you go about your duties and your responsibilities. I hope you'll take it with you. Look at his answer in verse 3. This is what Nehemiah said. I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. And the title of my message today is never come down. Amen. Hey, friends of Steadfast Baptist Church, Jacksonville, never come down. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you understand? Never come down. God has given you a great work to do. Right. And you're going to face great opposition. I know you're aware of that. You understand that probably. Never come down. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Stick with the task. That's right. It's the task God has given you. You want to be faithful. What does the Scripture remind us of stewards? That a man be found faithful, no? That yeah. a lady be found faithful, right? Yeah, that's right. When we get to heaven, when we get to eternity and we face Christ, we want to be able to look at the Lord and say, Lord, whatever You, you tasked me with, whatever You gave me, I just did my best to be faithful to those commands and what You gave me to do. And He'll be able to say, well done. So this is Nehemiah, right? Never come down. So just as Nehemiah had a great work from God to do, and we'll look at several things in, in this book of Nehemiah this morning to see that, to get an idea, a picture of just what this man did. And obviously it's Holy Scripture, and we know all Scripture is profitable, right? Yeah, right. For us to grow, to learn. Yeah. And so we're going to learn from Nehemiah, and that's what I hope we can do, that we can learn from this man, because he's, he's a great leader. He's got a lot of lessons, just very practical things that you can do today and tomorrow. They make sense, they're straightforward, and we can see success if we'll take after his example. So just as he had a great work to do, so you have a great task here in Jacksonville as well. Yes. And as I think about you folks, I know this is my first time meeting you, it really is. Just met some of your men yesterday, and man, we give God glory for all that he did. God's fingerprints are all over this place. This local church right here. Yes. You folks. I, I remember the circumstances of Brother Fannin coming of many of you who I think probably had made plans, did you not? Oh, yeah. 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 And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, what? 
False prophets come to town? Well, that got shut down. God took care of that, did He not? Yeah, yeah He did. And so maybe you begin to wonder and you think, man, I've made these plans, Lord. I've decided maybe you're a man here and you'd already put in that notice. Maybe you'd already started the process of selling a home or moving from where you're renting and finding another place, moving your family. It can be tough on a family, on children, right? Yeah. And you're thinking, God, what is going on? God's faithful, isn't He? Yeah. Amen. And he's true. And I'm, think, I'm, think, I'm thinking of the verse in Matthew when Christ was talking to Peter. Matthew 16, 18. You don't need to stand, uh, turn there, but I'll go ahead and read it. It says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, Christ talking to him, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Friends, when I think of faithful, faith, excuse me, I'm going to do that over and over again. Y'all got to bear with me. Okay, when I think of steadfast Baptist Church of Jacksonville, I think of this verse. Right. Amen. Because God decided to plant this church here. Right. Yes, and your he did. folks are the ones that decided to obey and see the victory that God gave. Amen. And that's why you're here today. So I rejoice with you. And you know, yesterday. I believe almost all, if not all the men would agree with me. I'm going to go ahead and say all the men. At the soul winning marathon, I get to Panera Bread, but I wasn't the first person there. I thought I was at least on time or early. Um, but there's your crew. And you know, it's a great thing when you walk into a restaurant like Panera Bread. There's like six men sitting at a table right in the middle with their Bibles open. You know what I mean? Yeah, that'll warm your heart. That'll bring you joy. You'll, you know you're in the right crowd when that happens. You know, hey, this is what I want to be a part of. These are the people I want to be with. These yeah. are the people I want to fellowship with, I want to talk to, I want to do things with. That's right. So yesterday when that took place, I knew that God is going to show up today. He's going to do something because He'd already sent His servants to come and work and labor in His field. We know they're white unto the harvest and the laborers came. So I was grateful yesterday to see that so six men in the middle of a restaurant with their Bibles in hand, ready to go soul winning for at least four to five hours all day on a Saturday. And I know you can think of other things to do on your Saturday. <coughs> My wife and I, Michelle, we have six little ones and the labor just doesn't stop. It's a constant task list, right? There's much to do. Now let me just stop and say this. I've noticed y'all have a lot of kiddos, a lot of young people here. That's a wonderful thing. I know you do a lot of work to help train them. But let me go ahead and plug for this. Let me just share from my heart. I grew up under a Baptist grandfather who was a vehement preacher. I mean, he just, he would zing. He loved his Bible and he preached hard. Yeah. I remember. I was their age. It was my grandfather's hard preaching that saved me from a life of ruin. And now as a grown man with my own family, I'm grateful. I'm thankful my mom and my dad brought me eight each and every Sunday and had me sit in a chair and not get whisked away, but had me listen to hard preaching. Because it's the hard preaching now as a grown man that I remember that affected my life, that helped me understand it was worth it to read this book and do my best to understand it and obey it as God has commanded me to do. Amen. Yeah. So parent, you listen to me. You're doing the right thing and you stick with it. Yeah. All the lack of sleep, moms, the long hours you put in, the relentless laundry piles, the task list, the training, the teaching that goes on all week long, all day long, and even many times on Sunday. You think, I, I don't know if I can do this. It's worth it. I want to commend you and I want to encourage you in that area. Don't quit. Never come down. Never come down from the work that God's given you. Just like we see Nehemiah said, I cannot come down. That's good. So great work is being done here. The priority for Steadfast Baptist Jacksonville is right here in Jacksonville, right? Some 1.5 million people in Metro Jacksonville area. A great work to do, and I see your map. Brother Fannin pointed that out. Man, my heart just leaped. Because that's just... That right there is a sign of a church that means business. That's right. yes, they believe sir. the book. It's not just we're going to come to church because that's what we do. It's not just we're going through the motions. I know we all battle that from time to time, do we not? Sure. But overall, your heart beats for this book. Yes, your heart beats to know more truth. 
And you got your map up there because you want other people to know the same thing. You want other folks in this town where you live to have the same joy welling up inside of them and that they would come and join you in the work. And we're going to see that in Nehemiah as well. So once again, steadfast Jacksonville never come down. Never come down from the task God has you. So let's look at this man, Nehemiah, shall we? We read 6, 1 through 4. I want to jump over to the end of the chapter and read one more verse. Look at verse 15. The Bible says this. Nehemiah speaking, because this is kind of an autobiography. Nehemiah is the writer, and he's just giving you a first-hand account. So it makes it a great, great um, insight into exactly what went on in all the details. And in verse 15, he says this. So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Eul, in 50 and 2 days. So at the beginning of the chapter, chapter he points out, yeah, Sanballat, Tobiah, the wicked, they show up, they oppose me, they try to draw me down, get me to stop, distract me. He has the right attitude, he has the right answer, he's God's man, he's a true leader, he's got people watching him, following him, men, women, children, they know he's God's man. He's even been appointed by King Artaxerxes and sent. Yep. Sent with money. Sent with authority. And of course we know God's authority because he's going to go do a work for the Lord. And the wicked come along and try to pull him off task. Try to get him away from what God's given him to do. But he doesn't come down. And in verse 15 we see the results. So the wall was finished. Hey, friends, Christian friends of Steadfast Jacksonville, y'all want to see this through, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Amen. You look like you're doing well. I, you know, I know there's a lot of work to be done, but you seem to be happy to be here. Y'all have great fellowship. Do you want to see it grow? Yes. Yeah. It can. It will. And God will do it through you. Just like He did through Nehemiah and the faithful that followed His leadership as He obeyed the Lord. So, let's look at some ways practically from this man Nehemiah that we can make sure that we never come down let's look at some examples from Nehemiah because he does set a great example for us today even so that we as God's men as God's women will never come down from God's work let's take a look at Nehemiah the first thing I'd like to point out is Nehemiah maintained a practical and clear vision of the work to do let me repeat that Nehemiah maintained a practical and a clear vision of the work to do. Look at chapter 2. Go over to chapter 2 rather. You're there in chapter 6, but go to chapter 2 and we're going to look at one verse in chapter 2 in verse 18. This is what Nehemiah said, Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And he said, Let us rise up and build. So they, meaning the people, strengthened their hands for this good work. So, I'm going to back up just a little bit to fill in the context, and then verse 18 is going to make real, really good sense. Nehemiah, right, is over in Shushan the palace in the Medo-Persian Empire, God says. The Bible says, far away from Jerusalem, far away from the remnant that's there in Jerusalem, many are over still in captivity, right? But then, Nehemiah gets sent, right? You know the story. He spills his heart to King Artaxerxes. The Bible says the queen was sitting there as well. The king's heart is at the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. We see that in Pharaoh. We see that in Nebuchadnezzar. We see that in King Artaxerxes. We see that in King Ahasuerus. None of these men necessarily godly examples of leadership, but clearly in the Bible, God set them up and God pulled them down. So God's in control 100%. It's not haphazard. The Bible says he steers these men. And so Artaxerxes sends a godly man over to Jerusalem. So when we come to 2.18, Nehemiah is already established as the head, the leader, the governor, right? Yeah. And he says, then I told them. So he finally divulges his plan, you know, his vision for what God had put in his heart to do. And he says, so they, in conclusion, in the end of the verse, strengthen their hands for this good work. Well, I've learned something about people. I don't know everything by any means. I'm learning a lot. I want to be a pastor. I'm learning a lot from Pastor Anderson, Pastor Romero, Pastor Jimenez, Brother Fannin. And I've learned, you know, people have to have vision if you want them to follow you. You better give them a clear-cut vision for what you want to do and what God can do through them. That's right. And it better be clear from the Scripture. That's 
That's right. Nehemiah did that. And what you see is it says these people strengthen their hands to work. They're like, I'm going with you. What do we do? Yes. Tell yeah. me. Nehemiah, what do I do? Set me to task. Set me to work. Just tell me what to do. My heart's in it. There's waiting for leadership, right? Right. I had the skills. I had the willingness. Nehemiah presents that vision. So they set their hands. They strengthen their hands to the work. So the first thing we learn from Nehemiah is that he maintained a practical and clear vision of the work to do. Proverbs 29, 18 is still true, is it not? Where there is no vision, you know it, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is, happy is he. So we know it's true that when a man of God's willing to cast God's vision, this book, right? I know, there's a, I know there's a lot here, but there's plenty of things that you can jump right on right away. I take uh, yesterday as an example. I don't think I ever get tired of talking about soul winning. Sure. Let me explain why. Number one, it's, it's so biblical. Yeah. And many of you know the joy of being able to take the gospel and show someone else how to know that they can go to heaven when they die. Yeah. Amen. Fills your heart with joy. Yeah, you know you're obeying the Lord. So the Holy Spirit confirms that you're doing what He's commanded you to do. I just never get tired of it. I mean, either. But it takes a pastor, a preacher, a leader to cast that vision because soul winning's hard work sometimes, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Some of these men are exhausted this morning. And then there was wives and, and ladies behind them that took care of the children while they were gone all day. Double the work there. But then we know that 56 people avoided hell yesterday. Amen. Amen. Because based on the Bible, yeah. and what we showed them, they decided, yeah, I'll change my mind about what I'm trusting in. I'll put my trust in Christ and what He did for me on the cross, and I'll receive this gift of eternal life. And they did. And we watched it with our own eyes as the preacher, as the witness. And so today we're here, and even though you're tired and weary and you're wondering, can I keep this up? Perhaps there's great joy in your heart. I'm glad you did it. Yeah. Vision. I'm grateful for Pastor Anderson casting that soul in vision. And let me just share with you, maybe I, I don't want to put words in, in Pastor Anderson's uh, mouth, but when I listen to him, you know, he talks about Arizona all the time. Yeah, he talks about missions. He talks about his plan for the gospel in the, in the United States. Y'all know about March 31st and the soul winning mega marathon that's coming up and I hope you'll make your plans and do what you can to be a part of that in whatever way God would direct you. Hopefully you can go out and preach, share the gospel. And so, I know that he has that bigger vision, but let me tell you, I hear him talk about Arizona all the time. He talks about Phoenix, and this side of Phoenix, and this town on that side of Phoenix, and this Indian reservation, and that Indian reservation. I'm telling you, the man is convinced and he knows he can reach his whole state with the truth. Amen. And it works. We're seeing people saved left and right. I know you are too. And as the numbers grow, so the increase. Because the gospel doesn't change. You just add more soldiers. You add more laborers. You add more of those who have been working on their gospel. And their gospel is getting better and more clear. And the more they win to Christ, the more they understand how to answer hard questions, and the more they know how to answer biblically those questions that sinners have. They see more people trust the Lord. So Nehemiah was a man of great vision. He maintained a practical and clear vision of the work to do. And I can think of two ways he did this, and I hope you'll see it from the text. First of all, he prepares his own heart. Go to chapter 1. Let's we'll start at the beginning now. How does he maintain a practical and clear vision? He prepares his own heart. And here's what I mean. He first took responsibility for his own sin and then the sin of the nation. Think about it. He took responsibility for his own sin and the sin of the nation. Nehemiah 1, 4, I'll begin reading there. There, the Bible says, And it came to pass when I heard these words. So Nehemiah got word, right? Of what the condition of Jerusalem was. I know I'm pulling you away from the text. I apologize, but if you just look up here for a moment. Nehemiah got word from Hanani, right? Okay, walls broken down, gates burned. The people, they're afflicted and under a reproach. You know, there's nothing good about those descriptive words, right? Walls torn down. Gates burned, and the people that are there, well, they're under approach and great affliction, the Bible says. That's the condition. That's the report he gets. And he's thousands of miles away. And how his heart must have ached because he wanted to do something about it. Well, he does. He prepares his own, his own heart. That's where he starts. So we're in verse 4. I promise to keep reading this time. The Bible says, And it came to pass when I heard these words, 
that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which, which thou commandest, thy servant Moses. Pretty clear, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Nehemiah just owns it all right there. He does. Hey, yeah, maybe my town's wicked. Yeah, maybe this church is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Hey, maybe that church is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Nehemiah didn't go down that road. He just said, God, it's me. Yeah, I'm the problem. Amen. So fix me, God. Yeah. My father's house. I take accountability for it. And use me. In fact, Nehemiah goes as far as to say, you know, all of them. God, we are accountable. And isn't that true? When the independent Baptist of all people Decide soul winning isn't important anymore. Come on. Decide intense Bible reading isn't important anymore. Come on. Then who will? Do you think the United Methodist Church is going to go soul winning? No. Do you think that the fun centers are actually going to preach a clear gospel? No. They're giving them candy and bringing in you know, yeah. entertainment and music and it's all attached to wickedness in the world? Yeah, yeah it's wicked. God's angry about those things. And that's all failure. And I'm not saying Baptists always have everything right, but let's face it, we have the true Word of God. We know the truth. Right. And historically, we know how to get it out yeah. and yeah. share it with people. We know what church is supposed to be about and we're accountable for that. Me and I understood this. So, how did he maintain that practical vision? Well, he started with himself. He just prepared his own heart. He said, God, I'm guilty. My Father's house and all of us are. My whole nation. You know, maybe Nehemiah could have. He used the phrase, he could have. He could have. He could have said, well, Hannah and I, what are you going to do about it? He could have said, what, do I, what could I do about it? I'm just a cupbearer. I'm stuck here in Shushan. He could have, he could have, he could have, but he didn't. That's right. He just went to God and said, God, I'm willing. It's the here am I statement that we see. Yeah. Yes, sir. Scripture. I think of two other examples in the Bible. Maybe your, your mind runs to them. Moses and Paul. Let me just read two verses to you. You don't have to turn there. First of all, let's, let's bring up the Apostle Paul as an example. A man that we see has this same character trait as Nehemiah about preparing his own heart. Just taking responsibility for the condition of the people. Paul said this in Romans 9.3, For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren. Do you remember him saying that? Yeah. And I can only think, maybe you can think of others, I can only think of two men in the Bible that actually pray this or actually put that, that theoretical thing out there, that, that statement that, man, perhaps I could be a curse to know that all my brethren have eternal life, that they were all saved. I mean, what a heartbeat, right? The yeah. Apostle Paul. That he would even throw that out there hypothetically, right? He's just willing to take responsibility for his own sin, for the sin of his people. Moses did the same thing in Exodus 32, 32. Moses said this, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, speaking of the people, right? And God called them a stiff-necked people, right? Yeah, he did. And if not, blot me out, Moses said, I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. Do you see Moses' heart in that statement? Can you connect Paul and Moses and Nehemiah now? Do you see how they're men of vision? They don't pass the buck. They don't look to the next guy. They just set out and do it themselves. Amen. God, I'm the man. I'm accountable. Fix me and I'll go and obey you. I'll do what you want me to do. And I've learned God always honors that. Yeah. Does He not? Yes, He does. God's faithful. So He prepared His own heart. That's how He maintained that practical and clear vision. That's what kept Him from coming down from the work. There's a second thing I thought. He prepared a plan. Nehemiah is an excellent planner. I want you to know, I, I learn a lot from Nehemiah because planning doesn't come natural to me. I have to work very hard at it. I thank God for a wife who is naturally a timekeeper and detail just falls into place for her more easily. I have to work hard at that. 
But Nehemiah, you can see, is a man of detail. That's, that's a skill for him, and he uses it for God's glory. He puts it into play immediately, and we want to look at that because that helps us understand how he was able to, to put out this vision, to maintain this vision, which kept him from coming down from the work when Sambal and Tobiah showed up. He prepared a plan. Verse 11 says this in chapter 1. Look there. I'm going to begin reading at the beginning of the verse. I'll just start there. Verse 11, the Bible says, Nehemiah is in his prayer. He says to the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. Key word here. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. I love that word prosper. Nehemiah is just bold faced saying, Lord God of heaven, you've got to prosper me. We know his heart's prepared. He's already passed through that issue. He's already dealt with sin. He's prepared himself. And now the second thing he does is he prepares a plan and it starts right here in this, the end of this prayer. He says, God, prosper me. God, use me. Do something in my life. Not just my neighbor, not just my fellow church member. Do something with me. Nehemiah wanted God to use him, so he prepared a plan, and it started with him just saying, God, prosper me. Another way you see that he prepared a plan is that he sees his opportunity to implement his plan as soon as he gets it. Look in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Let's turn over one chapter. <coughs> so he goes before the king, right? Nehemiah is before him, and here's what he says. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make requests? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And will, when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. I mean, just in these few verses, do you see all the detail that Nehemiah rolls off his tongue, that he just rolls out a plan? As soon as the king asks him one or two questions, boom, out it comes. See, his heart's already prepared. He's already dealt with sin. He's already spent time in prayer. He's already been talking to God about these things. There's already a plan in his heart. So as soon as an opportunity presents himself, boom, he's gone. Yeah. I think of you men yesterday. I'm grateful for y'all. It would have went differently if Steadfast Baptist Church Jacksonville representatives hadn't shown up. We had a great harvest because some gospel-knowing, gospel-preaching men said, I'm going to make that sacrifice. Some godly ladies supported those men in their decision, took care of some dear children so they could make a crazy, hurried trip over, spend some solid time sharing the gospel, see some people saved, and then hurry home. It was because there was a plan. And as soon as an opportunity came, you men seized it. God bless you for that. I know your heart's full of joy. I know you're probably already thinking about doing it again when the opportunity comes. Nehemiah was the same way. He sees that opportunity to implement his plan. There's another thing he does. He develops his plan. Chapter 2, verse 11 through 16, let's read. The Bible says, So I came to Jerusalem, was there three days, and I arose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither, neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. So it's just Nehemiah and the beast he's riding on at night, and no one knows what he's doing. Kind of incognito, you know? I mean, the plan hasn't been revealed to the people yet. Let's read on. Verse 13, And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, into the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Chapter 1 told us about that. Verse 14, Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. You get the impression that it wasn't clear. Probably rubble, destruction, pieces. He's just trying to fit himself and his donkey or the beast through to be able to review the damage, to assess what, what's left of the wall. Verse 15, Then I went up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. Verse 16, And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Verse 17, Then I said unto them, and we see the conclusion when he finally tells them, 
So Nehemiah develops his front plan in chapter 2, verse 11 through 16. You say, well, Chad, what do you mean? Here's a man. He's already got great vision, right? He's got a plan. He's got the king behind him. He has the money. He has other men from the government supporting that work. Because we know, we already agreed, right? God's directing the heart of this king, Artaxerxes. Nehemiah is, is God's man doing what he's supposed to do. So now he's not in Shushan anymore. Do you see the transition? Now he's there. Friday you were here, men. Saturday you were in Pensacola with the Bible ready to go. Right. Nehemiah was in Shushan. And then God puts him in Jerusalem and now he's on a, on a beast riding around assessing the damage. Why? Because we know he has a plan, right? Yeah. And now he's going to develop it. Amen. So he's walking the wall. He's observing it. He's looking at it. Because he knows, I've got to put these people to work. Yeah. I've got to show them what to do. If I'm going to do that, I've got to know what it needs. And so he's just doing due diligence here. He's a faithful man. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing glorious about what he's doing here. I mean, he probably could be at home resting, you know, at his newfound place. Remember, he even asked for lumber, I think, from the king to build a house so he could live in it, take care of his servants and the men he needed to do this great work. And so he's out at night riding around on a beast with no one else in the loop on that, assessing the damage because he's getting his game plan together. He's taking it another step. So he does that. And then basically you say, well, Chad, how do you get all that? What's the conclusion? Well, all of chapter 3, which I'm not going to read for sake of time, all of chapter 3, let's read verse 1 and 2, and then I'll make a conclusion for you. Because all of chapter 3 is the details of the plan. Verse 1 says this, Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mia. They sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them Zakur the son of Imri. So what I want to point out just in those two verses is if you were to read all of chapter 3, what you're going to find is you're going to find a, ver a word that's going to come up over and over again. I'm going to point it out. Verse 1, let me jump to verse 2. Second word. And next unto him. Look at verse 4. And next unto them. Verse 5. And next unto them. Verse 7. And next unto them. Do you get the idea? Yeah. It's not a one-man show. No, it's not. You see his plans in place now, right? Yeah. He's done his due diligence. He's a faithful man. He's put it in place. See how the vision's coming about? Yeah. Now you have the people lining up. He and his family's here. He and his family's here. And I just look at the church this morning and I think, he and his family's here. He and his family's here. He and his family's here. And you're lined up because you want to know what God has said. And you want to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. And you can. Nehemiah is a great example of to us. He's a man of vision. He maintains that practical and clear vision Amen. of the work to do, of God's work to do. And so, chapter 3 is about all the different groups of people. The teams, the leads. The way they're sectioned off. Each of them has their section. One group tried to take on a whole wall like that. He would never accomplish it. He's a man of vision. And he has a plan to support that vision. So that's the first thing I want us to see about this man, Nehemiah. that helps us to understand why he never came down from the work. Why he just never even thought about it. In fact, he just kept giving those guys the same answer. I can see him on the fourth time. He's probably like, oh, done told you. Done told you. Know, you know what I mean? He's getting to the point. He's like, you know, would y'all just go on? Just leave us alone. Get lost, we would say, right? Yeah. We're busy doing a work for the Lord. We don't have time for you. No, I'm not going to apologize for saying that. These men are wicked. Yeah. Yep. We know they're wicked because they're actually opposing the work of God on purpose, conniving, lying, deceiving. Yeah, that's true. They're fighting God. Yeah, they are. And Nehemiah is a wise man. He just keeps giving them the same answer. Doing a great work for the Lord. I can't come down. I'm doing a great work for the Lord. I can't come down. You know what? That needs to be your response. That needs to be my response. Amen. Because I understand you got family and friends who don't understand why you're here at this place. Right. You know, we're not going to be rude and unkind to them. We're going to do our best to help them understand, get them to, to join us perhaps if they know the Lord, if they're born again. But let's face it, it costs us something. And that's okay. With Nehemiah and his crew, it cost them something. And in this case, they just flat out had to oppose the wicked. So Nehemiah is a man that maintained a practical and clear vision of the work to do. There's a second thing he did. Let's consider that. Nehemiah confronted opposition to the work. He just flat out confronted the opposition. I'm already hitting on that. I know you're with me. So let's look in chapter 2, verse 20. Look there with me, if you will. Nehemiah 2.20. Then answered I them, speaking of Sanballat and Tobiah, and said unto them, The God of heaven 
He will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But, and that's a huge word there, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Do you get the impression that Nehemiah is black and white? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe, what, let's read it again. Maybe there's a gray area in here. <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. It's crystal clear. It's black and white. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing a work for the Lord, and you're not. Amen. Yeah. And you're not trying to throw that in their face, but when you know they're wicked, you just have to get through and say, look, I can't come down. Steadfast Jacksonville, never come down. Yeah, that's the right. job you have is from the Lord. He gave it to you. That's right. And you're going to have to oppose the wicked. It's just the nature of the task. Yes, sir. And you can. And you can do it well. Nehemiah did. And he's one of our heroes. He's a great man of the Bible. He doesn't get a lot of attention, but if you read the book of Nehemiah several times, I mean, you'll walk away and say, man, this guy over, overcame incredible things. Incredible opposition. He started out with nothing. He's just bringing a cup of wine or juice to the king. At least that's all we know about him. Next thing you know, he's in Jerusalem. The Bible later on tells us there's 50,000 people. And he's building a huge wall. And he's reinstating the Word of God and the reading of the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God. And he's doing a great and mighty work for the Lord. One man, just a cupbearer. Amen. Nehemiah was willing to confront opposition to the work. He said, ye have no portion nor right nor memorial in Jerusalem. So let's just look at some examples of the opposition he faced. Would you do that with me in the book of Nehemiah? Yeah. I'll move along quickly, but we want to be people of the book, right? We want, yes, don't want to just make things up. We want to know it. It's stated. It's written down. So let's just look at the opposition he faced in the book of Nehemiah. First of all, 2.10. That's where Sanballat and Tobiah are introduced to us. So in verse 10, the Bible says, When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, I think that's funny there. God has a sense of humor. Oh yeah, by the way, the second guy, he's just the servant, the Ammonite. You know, there's not even two guys here. It's like 1.5, you know. He's just the servant, oh, the Ammonite, you know. And later on, you see him making goofy comments to try to sling the accusations like Sandballot does and he doesn't even hit the mark. You know, he talks about the whole fox walking up there. Yeah, haha, if the fox walks on the wall, it's going to fall down. You know, it wasn't even funny, really. And so, he's just, I don't know, I get a kick out of that, you know. Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, he heard of it and it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. And let me just say, that's the scripture for me to stand here with authority and say, these men are wicked. Yeah. Yes, Because you can see, as soon as anybody, Nehemiah is just one man at this point, he hasn't fully rallied the troops. He shows up, and it says that with these guys, he grieved them. Just because a man shows up to do God's work, it actually grieved their heart. That means there's turmoil. They're like, ah, we can't tolerate this. No, this is not good. We're not letting this happen. They're wicked. Yeah, they're wicked. They hate God. They hate what He's doing. They hate the Israelites. And the Bible says it grieves them. So that's where we're introduced to them. And then if you jump over to the end of the chapter in verse 19, it says, But when... Just mark it down, folks. You do anything for the Lord, it's not once, it's not twice. It's just when. They're just going to keep coming. Yeah. It's the nature of the work. So verse 19, But when send thou the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite... There he is again, Tobiah the servant... And Geshem the Arabian heard it. They laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Well, let me ask you a question. Did Nehemiah come of his own will? No. Well, there's a lie right there. See how they're already interjecting doubt? They're speculating. Oh, you're going to rebel against the king? Later on, Nehemiah says, No, you feign that of your own heart. Right, right. It didn't come out of my heart. My heart was to say, Lord, I'm, I'm the guilty guy, and it's my people. Would you use me? And God said, yeah, I'll do that, and I'll turn the king's heart, and I'll give you everything you need. Yes, he did, bro. And I'll send you. And there he is doing the work. But the wicked show up and start throwing around lies and interjecting doubt. you faced that, haven't you? Yes. Okay. So people just don't understand. No, they don't. Like, man, you know, why why'd you do that with your kids? Man, you moved them all the way down there to Jacksonville. Man, here comes all the speculation and mm -hmm. criticism. You know, that's okay. Nehemiah endured it. He went through it. Notice how they ask a question. 
it says they despised, Nehemiah said they despised us. And they said, what is this thing that you do? Really as if it was any of their business. This man was sent by King Artaxerxes. Yeah. Nehemiah could have said that. None of your business. Get lost. So the wicked will come. And there's a lot of examples of opposition. Let's look at two more, our gracious listeners. So the first one we see here is we're seeing opposition from without. Does that make sense? So right now, Nehemiah, he's, he's getting it cranked up, right? The ball's starting to roll. Things are starting to move forward. Just like you guys here. Things are moving forward. Y'all are here. You're soul winning. You're, see people, you're seeing people come. You're doing your very best to raise godly seed. I had this thought, and maybe I shared it with the men yesterday. I know I've talked with other men about it at Faithful Word. My heart revels in this fact. What will it be like when our kids are soul winners? What will it be like when the children of Steadfast Baptist Church Jacksonville, Steadfast Baptist Church, Faithful Word Baptist Church, Verity Baptist, when the next generation actually takes the Word of God that they've been studying their whole life? You see, my granddad was a soul winner. And I'm ashamed to say there was about 10 or 15 years of my life that I was disobedient because even as a young man, he used to call me up on Saturday and say, hey son, you want to go with me? And he'd go out for a couple hours, knock doors. Bring people to Christ. I watched it all the time. I used to do it with them. You know, I, I, I was very, as a teenager, I wasn't very bold. I knew scriptures, but I, I wasn't very goal, bold. I wasn't really successful at answering people's questions from the Bible. But I remember speaking to people, and I remember grand, Granddad Hearn winning people to Christ. And I did that a little bit in college, and then I just stopped. And yesterday I'm grateful because we had a little bit of redemption in the yeah. town that I was not faithful to. So I just share that with you. There's going to be opposition from without. And we see that in Sanballat and Tobiah. You're going to face opposition from without. Yeah. Just be prepared for that. Let's look at two more examples of that. Jump over to chapter 4. Let's just finish up this thought on Sanballat and Tobiah, the opposition of this godly man, Nehemiah, and the work he's doing for God. Remember, Nehemiah said, I can't come down. So my admonition, the title is Never Come Down, right? So this second thought or reason why we see Nehemiah didn't come down is that he confronted opposition to the work of God. Here's Sanballat and Tobiah. So you're in chapter 4. Let's read verse 1 through 3. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall. So here they are again, right? He was wroth. So now he's not only grieved. Do you see the progression? Now they're not interjecting doubt and asking questions. Now he's just flat out angry. He's just angry at Nehemiah. It says he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Verse 2, And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the ru rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite, there he is again, was by him. And he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. And then Nehemiah says in verse 4, Hear, O God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of, land of, of captivity. And then you're in chapter 4. Let's jump down to verse 7. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, like, uh-oh, they went back and got more. That's what it seems like, right? So it's not just two or three guys now. Now they got their hordes. What are you going to do? Let's read on. It says that when they heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God. So whenever we do a work for the Lord, we're going to face opposition, my friends. And a lot of that opposition is going to be from without. But also we need to understand that there's also going to be opposition from within at times. Yeah. I hate to say that, but it's just true. I think you understand. Look in chapter 3, verse 5, and there's just a key little phrase tucked in chapter 3. Remember, chapter 3 was the details. It was the organization of Nehemiah's plan You know that he had in his heart. and He finally developed it and put people in order. So, okay, here's your section, your team, go. Here's your section, your team, go. But tucked in that chapter, if you look at verse 5, it says, And next unto the Tekoites repaired, but... But their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. I like to call them the lazy nobles. Yeah. That's exactly what they are. It's the lazy nobles. 
And look, I understand all of us struggle with laziness every now and then. We're sinners, right? I mean, there's going to be battles. But overall, I know also that y'all are a hardworking group of people. If you're anything like Faithful Word, you just get it done. You don't complain. Hey, this is right. This is what God's given me to do. I'm happy to do it. Let's just get it done. That's probably your attitude. I see it in you. I've enjoyed meeting you and talking to you. And I've noticed that's just a vein that travels through all of the movement. Is it not? Through each of those churches. It's a like-mindedness that, hey, if God commanded it, I'll just go and do it. We'll figure it out. We'll get it done. So I know laziness is not common, but we will face it. And right here we have a great example of just one group that's just... No? Ever met people like that? They might talk a good talk, but... They're the one that grabs the chair first. Yeah. And you already got, you know, bead, sweat beading up on your forehead, you know? Whatever. It doesn't work. So I'd like to call this some opposition from within. I just encourage you to be aware of those things. You know, we ought to be faithful to one another. And if we see a fault in a brother or sister's life, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Not a big deal. Just go to them. Yeah. Talk about it briefly. Maybe you can help them. Iron sharpens iron still, right? Yes, yeah. it does. That's what we do for one another. Amen. Right here, we had some nobles who weren't willing to be sharpened. These were some lazy men, so you see a little bit of opposition from within. And you know, this is not the only example in the Bible. I think of another one that I'd like for us to turn to. So go to the book of Acts with me. Okay? We'll go quickly. Go to the book of Acts. Remember the Apostle Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey? So Antioch had sent them out, right? All right? So go to Acts chapter 14. The book of Acts chapter 14. So the context is Paul and Barnabas going out on the missionary journey. And so they're preaching up a storm, right? I mean, they're just going from town to town, preaching the gospel. You know, this is the book of Acts. We see all kind of action in the book of Acts. It's the continuation of what we saw at Pentecost, right? God's pouring out His Spirit. He's doing miracles. He's doing mighty things to these men because He's establishing His church and He's establishing the Gospel and He's demonstrating to these men that I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it and I'm going to use you to do it. So Paul and Barnabas are out getting, the, getting it done. right? They're planting churches. They're preaching the Gospel. And so you're in chapter 14. Let me pick up in verse 15. The Bible says, Acts 14, 15, and saying, Sirs, why do you do these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from the vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained them, they then the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. Verse 19, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came to the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to, Der to Derbe. Okay? Jump down to chapter 15. I'm just going to read two more verses, okay? Paul was stoned, right? You catch that? Yeah. We're in chapter 15. Let's read two more verses. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Whoa, problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Doctor, okay, good. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, you got to laugh there. The Bible has great vocab. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of emphasizing with the diminutive, you know, no right. small dissension. It was a blow up. Yeah. Paul and Barnabas were hot. They're like, yeah. no, that's wrong. That's yeah. false doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the way we're saved. Not. No small dissension and disputation with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So what I just want to point out to you all is right here, back to back chapters. Paul and Barnabas are obeying the Lord just like you, just like me. We want to heed the Lord's command to the Great Commission and to live a righteous life, to faithfully assemble together, not forsake assembling together of ourselves. So here these men are faithful. Chapter 14, they're being attacked from without. Paul gets stoned. And then right in chapter 15, getting attacked from within. Yeah, that's good. Coming from both angles. Did God sustain them? Absolutely. Sure. I'm not saying it was easy, but you can see victory. So Nehemiah is not the only one. We see it in the New Testament well in Paul and Barnabas. It's a great example, I think, there. Yeah. And with these lazy nobles, let me just point this out. Talking about opposition from without and within. 
if I remember correctly, New Testament still contains the verse, if any would not work, neither should he eat. Yeah. I just kind of wonder if maybe they starve these guys a little bit. Next week you find them out there with their shovels or with their tools. Yeah. Right. So it works. It does work. That's right. I want to give one more example of this. So Nehemiah is a man that we can see has great vision, right? He maintains a vision. It's a clear, practical vision of the work of God. And we can see he's a man that confronts opposition to the work. He told them, you have no portion with us. It's black and white, right? Yeah. And there's a great example in the Old Testament of this. And I love this example. Kiddos, I think you like this too. So if you still tuned in to me, let's look at a great Bible story. It's a true story. It's in the Bible. And it helps us understand what this man Nehemiah and his, his family and his friends and the people he led went through. So go to 2 Kings, please, chapter 10. 2 Kings, chapter 10. Do you all remember the man Jehu? King Jehu? Yeah. yeah. This guy's great. <laughs> Let me throw out one comment while you're turning there. 2 Kings 10. Do you remember the statement about him? The watchman said, yeah, I think it's Jehu, Nimshi. Why? Because he driveth furiously. Amen. Right? They knew this guy because they could see him coming. <laughs> because everything he did, he did 110%. It was full tilt all the way. I'm not holding back. If this is right, I'm in. I'm doing it, and I'm not pulling back. Amen. That was Jehu. So you're in 2 Kings 10. Let's read a little bit about him. I'm going to read three verses 2 Kings 10, let's start in verse 15. The Bible says, And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him, and he said to him, Is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot, and he said, Come with me, and see my zeal for the Lord. Amen. So they made him ride in his chariot. Verse 17, And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria, till he had destroyed him, according to the saying of the Lord. There's your authority, okay? Which he spake to Elijah. Of course, the prophet. That's right. So here we see King Jehu fulfilling Scripture. But I like the fact that God's just using the man that he is. He's like, Come and see my zeal. He's the type guy, I don't want to talk about it. Let's just go do it. Yeah, you know? Man. It's great to talk about it, but talk's cheap, right? Yeah. So let's just go do it. You want to learn how to be a soul winner? You don't have to speak. Be a silent partner. Just get out there with a preacher and say, hey, yeah. I'll pray. I'll go do it. That's good for That's you. Jacob. That's Jacob. Yeah. Amen. Hey, brother, is your heart with mine? Get in a chariot then. Because if you remember, something had happened previously. Let's look at that. Great story. 2 Kings 9. Let's go back a chapter. 2 Kings 9. I'll begin reading in verse 11. This man meant it when he said, come see my zeal. So putting it on reverse, we find out what he meant, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. 2 Kings 9 verse 11, the word of God says, Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord. The one said unto him, Is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? Because the prophet had shown up to anoint him, right? And he said unto them, Ye know the man in his communication. And they said, It is false. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and thus spake he to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then they hastened and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew them with trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram had kept Ramoth Gilead, he and all Israel, because of Hazael, king of Syria. So the wicked king of Judah and Israel, not following God, have unholy alliances. Let's find out what Jehu does, okay? But King Joram was returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him. I'm in verse 15 when he fought with Hazael king of Syria, and Jehu said, If it be your minds, then let none go forth nor escape out of the city to go to tell it in Jezreel. He's like, look, don't let the word out. Don't let the word out. Because we know he's basically saying, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming to town. I mean business. So verse 17, 16, excuse me. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. And Ahaziah king of Judah was come down to see Joram. And there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came. And he said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take an horseman, and send it to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? 
So there went one on horseback to meet him and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. You see the problem? That messenger knew when Jehu said, what do you know of peace? Get behind me. Is either get behind me or I'll kill you right here. Right. That was Amen. what was going to happen. Look, you're either with me or you're against me. There yeah. was no mincing words. The messenger had to make a decision for his life right there. Yeah. I'm either with Jehu or I'm with these wicked kings. Yes. Yeah, come on. That's right. He got behind. Yes, he did. Hey, and you know, if you're behind a good man, if you're behind a man that's going to preach and live the book, get behind. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Nothing wrong with that, right? We're all following somebody. I get so sick of that. Let me just... Sorry, folks, let me just stop right here. Maybe this will encourage you. You know, I grow weary of do-good, lazy, disobedient Christians who actually have time on social media to criticize the people who are actually getting it done. And they want to spend time criticizing Pastor Anderson or Preacher Fannin or Pastor Romero, or Brother Jimenez. It's wicked. It's wicked. Yeah. Or they sit at home. Watching their football game. Yeah, right. right. Snacking. Come on. And get their Bible out once a week, maybe, because they felt bad because the preacher, you know, hit a little bit on your devotions. <laughs> and they didn't even get through the chapter. I'm sorry. Let's just call it like it is. Yeah, you right. either mean business or you don't. That's right. We either get to work or we don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's either obedience or disobedience. That's the way Nehemiah was. Yeah. He's a yeah. black and white guy. That's right. So that's Jehu. He fits right in with them. I think they're birds of a feather. I really do. They had the same spirit could see that so let's read on and finish it so he got behind him right then he sent out a second on horseback uh oh round two <laughs> which came to them and said thus saith the king is it peace same question Jehu answered what hast thou to do with peace turn thee behind me and the watchman told saying he came even unto him and cometh not again and the driving is like the driving of Jehu the son of Nimshi for he driveth furiously it's like, uh oh. Oh, this ain't no average dude. Oh, uh, yeah. He wondered what went through his mind, right? And Joram said, Make ready. Yeah, that's a good statement. And his chariot was made ready. And, yeah. <laughs> and Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot, and they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. A lot of history there. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? Right. And Joram turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. Yeah, but the problem is the treachery is with the guy that fled. Yeah. And his wicked mom that's still, you know, supplanting the throne and following Baal and leading innocent people, or at least they're not innocent anymore, but down a path of wickedness. The reason he fled is because the man of God showed up. Yeah. And so we ain't going to do this anymore. It doesn't work. It's wrong. It's wicked. God's not happy. Come on. We're going to fix it. Yeah. Messenger, get behind me. Whoop. Messenger, get behind me. So they mount up and they're like, hey, hey, is it peace? He's like, what do you know of peace as long as your mom, who's wicked, still committing all those whoredoms? We don't have time, friends, but I think you know the story perhaps. He deals with her too. Yeah, he does. I know it's a rough story, but we just got to understand, just like Nehemiah, he confronted opposition to the word. Jehu confronted opposition. We don't have time to mess around and mince words and compromise. we got plenty of that out there. And people, they under, they're used to that. They want something else. Right. They want people who really know this book, have real compassion in their heart, really, men that really love their families according to the Bible, that lead their families, that love their church, that has compassion on souls. <clears throat> That's right. So Nehemiah confronted opposition. Hey, I hasten on. Jehu, just in conclusion, is an overt example of a man who confronts any and all opposition to God's work. And we should be likewise. That's right. Now let me be clear. I'm not recommending we go out and have a bad spirit, that we have bad language, that we're rude to people. That It's quite the opposite. Yeah. You know what I'm getting at. The fact is that when it comes to soul winning, our heart beats for the sinner because that's what we are, a sinner truly saved by grace, right? Amen. And we go out to share that with anyone else who's listened. But let's also be honest, it's two sides, right, to that coin. There's folks out there that have heard the truth and heard the truth 
and heard the truth, right? And then they get to the point where they just decide like these wicked men, we're grieved. We're angry. Why are they doing this? And they just start opposing God. Well, guess what? We're going to oppose them. Because we see the example in the Scriptures. And folks, you're right to do that. You got a family member that starts to get real aggressive in their comments. You're just going to have to get to the point where you, you tell them like it is and have to get upset or out of offhand. Hey, maintain. Good, clear, but just tell them what it is. Yeah. You never know. For the simple who stand in mind, it might change them. Yeah. Might gain someone from your family or a friend. Let me give you one more thought this morning. My time's gone, okay? So the common is never come down, right? Yeah. Steadfast, Baptist Jacksonville, never come down from the work God has given you, just like we see in Nehemiah. And we know that he didn't come down. He didn't give in because he was a man of great vision. It was a clear and practical vision of the work God had for him to do. We also know that he con basically confronted any opposition to God's work. He's willing to do that. That's, that's the hard part. Yeah, it it is. really is. It's not easy. It's weary sometimes. There's a third thing. Nehemiah consistently turned to God in His Word to continue the work. Let me say that again. Nehemiah consistently, when you read the book, you'll see this, he consistently turned to God and His Word to continue the work. You say, well, Chad, how do we know this? Let's look at some examples. First of all, I want to say you see it in his prayers. Okay, so let's blitz through this. I know your people the book. So first of all, jump back to Nehemiah chapter 1. To jump back over to the book of Nehemiah. We'll just start back at the beginning. We're going to blitz through probably about five or six verses so it makes sense. You, you string them together, I think it'll be clear. First of all, we know that Nehemiah consistently turned to God and His Word to continue the work that God had given him to do. How do we know that? Because we see it in his prayer. His first prayer was in chapter 1. We read a little bit of that. Let me read beginning in verse 8. So it says... Remember, I beseech thee, Nehemiah is talking to the Lord. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, do you see the hope, folks? Though there were of you cast out into the othermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. And then, of course, we read verse 11. So in this man, Nehemiah, in this prayer, you see that right away, as soon as he realizes Jerusalem's destroyed, breaks his heart, he's like, I want to do something about it. He goes to God. And we know that it was for some time, because it says in verse 4 that he fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. It says he mourned certain days. He just spends some time getting all that emotion out and thinking this through and saying, God, what do you want me to do? I know some of you probably did that. It's a big move. I'm a Floridian. <laughs> I grew up in Georgia, but I spent my whole... Really, I'm Florida. I'm in Arizona now, but I, I spent a lot of my life in Florida. Really, heart beats with the state to a degree, you know? Plus, I have my concealed carry from Florida, too. So <laughs> Arizona don't care. That, you do it. You, you know, conceal it. You can carry it open later, but... This is kind of cool. Say, so, yeah, I got it for you. So, you're here in Florida, and I know many of you come from other places. And you came here because you believed it was the right thing to do. Maybe there was some days of mourning. You had to sit around and think, husband and wife. Maybe there was some tough conversations. Because that's a huge decision. I was in Florida. I moved all the way to Arizona. I had friends and friends and family who literally thought I had gone off my rocker. Wow. They said, it's, "What are you thinking?" You crazy? I, they, they just didn't get it. And you know what? I realized, though those closest to us, we could explain, you know, try to help them understand. But overall, I couldn't spend my time trying to explain to everybody. I go and do what the Lord had called me to do. You're in the same way, are you not? Yeah. Just want to be busy about doing the Lord's work. That was Nehemiah. We see it in his prayers. Let's look at another prayer. There's a prayer in his heart before Artaxerxes. Just a real quick one. Look in chapter 2, verse 4. Of course, the king said, hey, what's wrong? Your countenance has changed. You've never seen this before. It's a fearful thing for him to be the servant and to not be in right spirit around the king of the whole empire. Yeah. So verse 4, Then the king said to me, For what dost thou make requests? And he said, So I prayed to the God of heaven. Is that not just a cry of his heart there? Yes. Oh God, here's my opportunity. Lord, help me. Lord, what do I do? Lord, I need you. Lord, would you, would you show your strength on behalf of my family? God, would you help me? 
Lord, I need a job. Lord, I need your help to raise these, these kiddos so that they'll be godly. Help me to teach them the Word of God. Can you see his heart just cry out? Yeah. God answered it. So I'm saying, Nehemiah didn't come down because he's a man that consistently turned to God and His Word to continue the work of God. And you see it in his prayers. Let's jump at another one. Chapter 4, verse 4, four through 5. So, Sanballat and Tobiah are doing their thing, right? Right in the middle, tucked in verse 4 and 5, it says this, Nehemiah's response. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Once again, do you see the black and white? Nehemiah is praying a precatory prayer here. He's saying, God, they're wicked. They've opposed you. And I just want you to do something about it. Amen. Yeah. God, he's saying, God, would you remove them? Yeah. Now, I understand it's up to God what He does sometimes in situations. Sometimes He has that person there as a tool to prove us, to see if we'll be faithful. I understand that. But in this case, Nehemiah just got the point. He's like, God, you've got to help me. Would you hear me? And take care of these wicked men. So you see it in many prayers. There's, there's a prayer for blessing. You don't have to turn there, but in chapter 5, verse 19, he, he, he made some sacrifices as a government. He says, Lord, I'm just trying to take care of your people. Would you bless me for that? I just want blessing from you. And you can tell it's just a cry from his heart. He didn't share that with anybody. And then in chapter 6, verse 9, which is where we started reading this morning, in chapter 6, he prays for something special. You don't need to turn that read. He says this, that chapter 6, verse 9, For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. And this is not, you know, proverbially speaking. He's saying, God, teach these hands how to finish this wall. Yeah. Folks, I'm a framer. I build houses. Um, just recently I moved to heating and cooling, but out in Arizona we had one day is 113 on the roof. Man, I'm a Floridian. I know heat like you guys, you know. But I was out there sheathing that roof on this house we built, and I looked down at my phone and I was like, man, this is intense. 113, you know, it was my first time in an Arizona summer. And I said, Lord, I, I don't sling plywood like I did as a college guy, you know. I'm not a big man, so, you know, the, the plywood was having a heyday with me, you know. So I say that to, just to say, you know, Nehemiah here, he prayed for strength, physical strength. He's like, God, I came to build this wall. We know in verse 15 that they finished it in 52 days. Because he had a plan, right? He casted that vision and he had a plan. He opposed the wicked. He didn't let them bring him down. He stuck it out. But then there came a point where it got so intense. He's like, God, you just have to guide my hands to the end. Help me finish what I started. Yeah. Steadfast Baptist, let me ask you. You got to finish what you started? Yeah. Yes, sir. You got a great group here. You got some people who are committed. People who love the Lord. You know the Word of God. You got a preacher who's going to preach the Word of God and does so faithfully. Amen. The potentials. Just really limitless. Right. We'll stay with God's word. Look at what Nehemiah accomplished. Fifty-two days. Think of the rejoicing that took place when they pushed that last stone into position, or hung that last gate, or drove in that last spike or nail. That's right. It was a great victory. So Nehemiah consistently turned to God and His Word to continue the work. We see it in his prayers. And then last thought here, my friends, we see it in the practice of group. Bible reading and preaching. Here's my last thought, so stick with me. Go to chapter 8. Tried to be as comprehensive as I could with the book, but it, it does have 13 chapters. There's a lot here. So when we go to chapter 8, here's what we find out about Nehemiah. We see that he reinstitutes the official and public reading of the law of Moses, the Word of God, publicly among all the people. It's expected of him. So you're in chapter 8. Let's look at this final thought. I'll read four verses, the first four. It says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe. He's a man of God too. He has a book there just before Nehemiah that you know about. So spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding. Kiddos, y'all were included. Everybody's there upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Man, that's a long service. Yeah. Man, that's, that's a long service. So from morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. 
And beside him stood Mattathiah, and Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Maasiah, and on his right hand and on his left hand, Padiah and Mishael, and Malchiah and Hashem, and Hashbadena, and Zechariah and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. So we know that Nehemiah, to consistently turn to God in his word, we know it's true because we see right here there came a point where once he built the wall, right then he just reinstituted public Bible reading yep. and required everyone to come in here. Yeah, yeah. He's a faithful man. Yeah, he was. I won't come down. I won't come down. Amen. I won't do it. We see that in his life. And you say, well, Chad, you know, how do we know it was Nehemiah's decision to return to this? Because the verses we just read, it just talks about Ezra, right? And that's true. I could read verse 5 and 8, but I think you know the story. Well, to conclude, let's conclude with the Scripture. I'll read those and we'll be done. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads. And they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. We read the list in verse 7 of the men that helped Ezra do this because they caused the people, this is the end of verse 7, they caused the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense, there it is, and caused them to understand the reading. And in the first few verses we read, chapter 8, verse 1 through 4, we know it was the book of the law, specifically of Moses, right? Chapter, one, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. And you say, Chad, how do we know it was Nehemiah? We'll go back to Nehemiah chapter 1. This is it. You ready? This guy's consistent. Verse 7. Remember that first prayer when Nehemiah took responsibility? Right? Here's what he said in verse 7. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments with that which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Trust me. This reinstatement of group Bible reading and preaching, that was a part of Nehemiah's plan. There's no doubt about it. God honored him. My friends, it's good to meet you and to know you a little bit. Don't come down. Amen. Never come down. That's Let's right. pray together. Father, I thank you for this man, Nehemiah. I thank you for your servants here. I pray that you'd bless him and all that to do for you. We love you and we thank you for your faithfulness to us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.